Well, today we're going to be talking about Christian finances this week and next week. I uh, wore my green shirt for money today. I didn't do that on purpose, but afterwards I thought, well, that fits in pretty well. Uh, kind of just to begin with, we're going to look at Proverbs 6, and there's two parts there that we want to think about. But uh, for Christians, the way we deal with money, what we do with it is important. How we get it is important, but even more important is how we think about it. I really am convinced that God, in His desires and in His wisdom, wants us to have the right perspective about possession. For instance, we know that money is not evil. A nice car is not evil. A nice house is not evil. A, a good job and a bank account, none of that is evil in and of itself. But the love of those things, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil is what the Bible says. So that in the end, what you have is not as important as how you see it and how you think about it. In fact, there's a, a biblical principle. It's the concept of stewardship. And it's the idea that we are technically not possessors of money and things. We are managers of money and material things. And part of that is we've been singing about heaven. The reality is that we live for a certain number of years in this world and you really don't take it with you. Although somebody did send me a, uh, an email picture of a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. Honestly, I, you know, I said so much for that illustration. Um, but we're managers. The reality is that God puts things within our grasp, within our possession, to manage. And the word steward really comes from the Old Testament. Abraham was a very wealthy man. God blessed Abraham. He had flocks and herds. He had great wealth. And he had a gentleman by the name of Eliezer who was his steward. Now Eliezer managed all of Abraham's wealth. He didn't own it. It wasn't his. But he took care of it. He worked it. He watched over it. And he was accountable to Abraham for how he did that. Well, that's part of the biblical concept that we are stewards, that God gives us possessions. He allows us to have things, and yet we will someday answer to Him for how we deal with and how we use those possessions. In fact, one of the great parables that Jesus told was about a master who had, it's called the parable of the talents, and the talents is not the ability to sing or do anything else. A talent was a weight. And he gave five talents, a very large amount, we assume, of gold to one servant. And then he had two talents, and he gave that to a servant. And he had another smaller amount, one talent of gold, and he gave it to a third servant. And then he went off and he left those servants to manage that wealth. And then there was a day when the servant, the master, came back. And there was a day of reckoning. And if you'll remember, two of the servants had really done a good job taking care of and managing that wealth, and one of them not so much. Well, the reality is that that's one of the ways we think about what we have, that we've been blessed. First of all, every good gift comes from God. The gift of life itself comes from God, and we have reason to be thankful, but we will be accountable. We'll answer to God for what we do with our lives, every word and every deed. And God gives some of us amazing opportunities. You realize if you live in America, you have opportunities for financial blessing that most of the world will never in their life ever even imagine. Some of us have abilities. We have gifts. We have talents. We have good physical health. We're able to go have a job. Some of us have good minds and we're able to do certain things. Some of us are able to use our hands and work with our hands and, and we have dexterity and we're able to go do it. But all of those gifts are things that God has given us and we will answer to God for how we use them. Now, not everybody has the same gifts or even the same amount. Some people have even greater opportunities than others. And some people take amazing opportunities and waste them. The parable of the prodigal son, who had great wealth given to him, a phenomenal opportunity. And we know that he goes to the far country and he, country and he wastes everything that God placed in his hand. Well, as Christians, we think about possessions. 
not as evil, but as an opportunity to, to make and to use and to manage, and someday we'll answer to God for what we did with them. And, and understand that the concept of giving, which is a part of stewardship, really is about obedience. God says you ought to give a portion back. But I'm convinced that the reason that we give, and on a proportional basis, the more we're blessed, the more we give, the reason we do that is that that's one of the ways you keep your mind right about possession. You don't assume that it's yours. You acknowledge at the very beginning it's God's, and you give Him a portion of all that He's given you to show that you know where it came from and to keep a perspective on all the rest. I just think there's a way that that works. And so all of that is stewardship. It's the concept of how we think about possessions, keeping the right attitude. Now, understanding that we need to see everything we have as a gift from God. We're accountable to God. We need to acknowledge it before Him. If we do that, then we begin to think about some of the very specifics. And in the passage that we're looking at today, there are a couple of really basic specifics. And by the way, let me just assume from the first service, this is not a fun sermon. Talking about money is not fun. So let me just begin. There's probably not any of us who've got money and finances and possessions nailed down and got it done right. All of us have things in the past we wish we could change. All of us sometimes wish we were doing things differently. All of us could be doing things better. This is a struggle for all of us, so we're all in kind of the same boat. But let's begin at this unique passage, and there's two sections. The first section is going to talk about debt. The second is going to give some advice using an ant as an example. So, let's begin. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger. Now, what this means is you have co-signed a loan for somebody else. That's what this is about. A putting up security for your neighbor means they borrowed money and you co-signed and you went into debt with them for their debt. That's not a good thing biblically. If you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, save yourself, for you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep, your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So the bottom line is, the Bible says debt is not a good thing. Just accept that. Debt is not a good thing. It's more specific in Proverbs chapter 22. That's the particular verse that says that the borrower is the slave of the lender. So when you and I borrow, we put ourselves in an obligation, and we are a slave. I always think it's really interesting. In one of Jesus' parables, he talks about one of the, the tragedies of being thrown into debtor's prison. In other words, you are in debt, and you can't pay your debts, and it's like being in prison. Isn't it that way today? But more than that, in that particular parable, being in debtor's prison is the analogy for hell. And I've talked to folks who've gotten themselves so far in debt, so deep in debt, are so obligated beyond their ability, literally their debts have become a prison to them. Their debts are a burden that rests over everything in their life. Their obligations literally are almost, I can't even go to the mailbox, I'm afraid, because of all of the bills and all of the debts. And we know that today, the number one thing that couples argue about is finances, and the vast majority of those arguments are about debt. Debt is not a good thing, and the Bible just basically says avoid it if at all possible. Now, there are a couple of places where maybe we would discuss that. Uh, I think most financial people, and years ago it was Larry Burkett, Dave Ramsey's kind of the name, there's a bunch of other names of individuals, and maybe probably as Christians we're talking more about finances than maybe we ever used to. In fact, I've talked to old preachers, and they never, ever talked about debt, or this never talked about those things. But maybe it's not a bad thing, because the Bible talks about it. Debt for a house is probably an okay thing. 
at least most people would at least acknowledge that. Uh, and the reason for that is that while you're borrowing money to buy a house, the house is appreciating in value. The only problem is you do know that inflation, interest rates are always higher than inflation, always. So that if you can buy a house, and let's just do some $100,000, you borrow $100,000 to buy a house. Karen and I are old enough that our first house cost $13,000. We just want you to know we got what we paid for. Uh, but so let's say you borrow $100,000 uh, and you borrow at 5% interest. Well, if you pay that house off in 15 years, you will pay just a little under $40,000 in interest over the life of the 15-year loan. And just to put that out, if you go to 20 years, you will pay $58,000 in interest. If you go for 30 years, you will pay $93,000 in interest. You will pay almost the value of the house, and the $100,000 house that you borrowed for costs you nearly $200,000. So in other words, interest is not always a good thing. Now the house is, a val is appreciating maybe 1% a year, maybe 2% a year, so that the house is growing in value, but it's still costing you something. But because it appreciates, that's probably an okay thing. Most financial people will suggest to you that because of this danger of debt, the real problem is borrowing money on things that depreciate. In other words, the moment you buy them, they're not worth what you paid for them. You ever gone to a yard sale? What you can buy stuff for? It's amazing. Our personal experience in the Marshall family, uh, 1980, I don't know, four or five, we bought a brand new LTD station wagon. Ah, oh, it was pretty. I mean, we borrowed $11,000 to buy that thing. Didn't have much money to put down. They told us it was a good deal. Bought it, $11,000. Six months later, loaned it to my sister to take kids to a church camp. She flipped it over and totaled that puppy out. And when I called the insurance company, they said, well, that's fine. It's worth $9,000. Well, they sent us a check for $9,000, and we were $2,000 in the hole. When they say it, you drive it off the lot, it goes down in value. It really does, especially you've got to replace it. Credit cards. Uh, today, one of the greatest tragedies in America is student debt. Students coming out of college very often with a phenomenal debt and very often with a degree that's not even going to get them a job. It's tragic. Kids with... $100,000 in student debt will not pay that off maybe through their entire working life just to pay off their student loan. Debt is not your friend. It's something to avoid. And especially when it's for things that you don't need. And the reality is, it's most of the time we borrow money for stuff that we want, but we don't have the money to buy. If you can't afford it because you don't have the money you really can't afford it. And borrowing money becomes this developing a slave mentality to my wants and my desires rather than reality. And so this passage says debt is not good. And certainly being connected to somebody else's debt is not good. And therefore, what this passage says, with a passion, get out of debt like you are the gazelle running from the lion. When Dave Ramsey talks about getting out of debt and he talks about working the debt snowball and paying your debts off and developing a plan and getting out of debt, he talks about gazelle intensity. This is the verse that that comes from. Get out of debt as quickly as you can. If you've got a mortgage, pay it off as fast as you can. My brother and I are going this week to a, a Dave Ramsey church stewardship conference. Uh, we're going to spend three days in Nashville, and uh, we're going to actually go to the plaza where they do the stuff, and he does it behind glass, and you have to register ahead of time so they have enough cookies because you get free cookies. That's the only reason I'm going is the free cookies. Uh, and while they're there, we'll probably hear people doing debt-free screams in the lobby. That's where they do that. Well, my brother and I, uh, we're, just, we're going to go to the conference, and it's about practices and about online giving, lots of things for churches and how to be good in a church for stewardship and how to help people do that. But my brother and I, uh, we were discussing a few years ago how much left we had on our mortgages. And it turned out that we had almost the same amount that we owed on our mortgages. 
And so we made a, uh, into a competition. Who was going to get out of debt first? In fact, Karen and I got a jar of marbles, and each marble was $1,000, and there were a number of marbles in the house, and every time we paid off $1,000, we got to take a marble out. And, and so my brother and I have been competing forever. I mean, we still argue over who's taller, and it depends. I, he's older. I think he's shrinking. I think I am. Uh, he thinks he is. But we made a competition about getting out of debt the quickest. I won about, about a month. <laughs> he got his paid off, and we got out of debt. And, but this idea of gazelle intensity, get out. Change your situation. Change your, if, if you're in debt, then Stop getting any more in debt. Don't dig the hole any deeper. And if you've dug the hole deeper, then try to fill it in. There's just that reality. So first of all, this is a really pointed statement about debt, and it's not a good thing. We need to guard against it. We need to be careful about it. Uh, I, you may have a credit card, but don't be using it for things that you really can't afford. And most of us times, we use it because it's convenient and it's something that we want. If you don't have the money in the bank, you don't need to be buying it. There's just something about that. And truthfully, most of us in America have lost all grasp of the difference between wants and needs. And so, he says, debt is not good. The Bible says that, says get out of debt. Now, the passage goes on a little farther, and he begins to talk about an example about the ant. Look at the ant. Go to the ant. Oh, sluggard. I love that word. I'm just, we'll come back to it in a minute. Consider her ways. And by the way, it almost hurts my feelings that it's a female ant that we're looking at. <laughs> Maybe saying that women are better at finances than men. I'm not sure about that. You think through that a little bit. Think about your own marriage. I'm in trouble already. Uh, <laughs> without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer, gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O oh sluggard? And when will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Well, there's a contrast. And basically, Proverbs is just giving wisdom, and he says, okay, look at the ant over here and look at the slug. Have you ever watched a slug for any length of time? I mean, if you want to see a slug move, how long do you have to watch? A long time. Slugs don't move. There's those little slimy kind of wormy things that leave the little silver trail. And I mean, they don't move very fast. And there's this analogy of, okay, they're slugs when it comes to money and working and jobs. They're slugs. They don't move very much. And then there are ants who move and never stop. And the analogy very simply is, that God expects His people to be like ants and not slugs. We ought to be working, and we ought to work hard. Now, that's been a recurring theme in this series of, of Christian difference, the concept of work and work being a dignified thing and, and a good thing, and we need to work. And I've thought about, got any teenagers you'd like to call a slug? <laughs> uh, got any little kids, you slug? Got some adults who are slugs, don't do anything, don't do very much. Somewhere there's an analogy, but for Christians, work is a good thing, a godly thing, an appropriate thing, a right thing. And, and you may be retired and you're, you're living off of the work you've done in the past. You still need to be productive. We've talked about that. But this idea of work is a good thing. And the people of God, God expects us to work and work hard and work well and God will bless that work. That's the concept, that as we work, God will bless it. And that's, frankly, how we solve some of our problems. And if you are in debt, if your finances are upside down, if things are wrong, if you're in the jail, the prison of obligations, then the way you get out is you work. You work at saving, you work at stopping, you work at changing, you work an extra job, you work, work hard, stop being a slug, become an ant. Ants work hard. Secondly, ants are responsible. Now, kind of an interesting piece, it says, 
The ant works and has no officer, doesn't have a master, nobody's the overseer. In other words, nobody's telling the ant what they ought to do. The ant has personal responsibility. The ant does what's right and what needs to be done because it needs to be done. Now we've talked before that we as Christians are personally responsible for our sins before God. We will answer for every word and every deed, and frankly, we will answer for every financial decision, good and or bad. That's the reality. And the truth is, if you want to get your finances to a better place, and there are not any of us who couldn't be to a better place, then you got to take personal responsibility for them. You need to not be blaming somebody else. Well, my finances would be better if my parents had left me more money. Or my finances would be better if the government was better. Or if the government did this, or the government did that, or my boss did this, or my boss did that. Somewhere, you need to stop blaming other people for the mess that you and I might be in. Own it. I blew it. Dave Ramsey talks about stupid tax. Karen and I have paid our share of stupid tax. 1984 LTD. Borrowed $11,000. $2,000 in stupid tax. We got a few others that we've entered in that we just kind of bring up, and every once in a while, it used to be painful to bring them up. Now it's mildly humorous. Buying club, that was was a dumb one. You paid a bunch of money so that you would save money on all the other money that you spent, but we didn't have any money to spend. Um, (laughs) Just dumb, dumb, stupid tax. Uh, somewhere you just got to own that. Yeah, that was dumb, boy. That's what that one cost us $635 35 years ago. Boy, was that dumb. Uh, anyway, own it. I'm in a mess. I'm in my mess because of my decisions, my choices, my mistakes, my failures. I'm in a mess. And the only way you get out is, first of all, to own it and accept your own responsibility. And that's one of the principles about the ant. The ant doesn't have somebody telling them what to do, helping them, holding them by the hand, walking over here. Somewhere you accept your own responsibility. And if your finances need to be better, you make that choice. You make that decision. With the grace of God and with His help and with wisdom and biblical principles, you make a choice and you do it. Well... The third thing the ant does is he saves. Now, that's kind of an interesting piece. You have to read it a little bit careful, and the Hebrew is a little bit awkward, but it really says, he harvests, she, excuse me, she harvests at one time and has food to eat at the summer. Now, what that means is, the the seasons in Israel are a little bit different, but the bottom line is, harvested in the fall, and didn't eat it all, and didn't use it all, and still had harvest left when the next summer came around. Now here's that principle. You live on what you need, but you need to live on less than what you make. And I don't care what you make. The the average in America, and it kind of goes back to that debt, the average family in America, as I understand it, lives on about 111 or 12% of their income every single year. Now, this is what God gives them. This is what they're blessed. This is the job they have. This is the money they bring in. And the average family goes 11% above that in debt every year. And it just adds up and adds up, and they have bigger houses and bigger cars and more credit card and more other things and more trips and more vacations and all those kind of things. And by the way, all of that stuff's fine. Remember, none of that's evil as long as you can afford it. As long as you have the money, you've saved it, you've prepared it, you've got it. But the ant doesn't use every last dime, sets it aside and saves it. Now, my personal opinion, this is what you make. You get a better job, you work a second job, you get some education, you get a different job, but you you make this much, whatever it is, out of that you start at the top and you give something to the Lord. And by the way, I will just tell you, I, I don't think you can do anything better or more important to make your finances work than to make sure that first you give something to God. Karen and I have been married almost 40 years. We don't kill each other in the next few days, and I don't say anything I shouldn't say in a sermon and deserve to die. Uh, I've said some things lately. I need to work on that, I guess. Uh, we got married. Um, we decided we were going to tie. 
We just felt like that was the right thing. I was teaching school, take-home pay, $635 a month. So once a month, we wrote a check out for $65 and gave it to the church. Our house payment, by the way, was $89 a month, so that kind of worked out well. For 40 years, we've tithed. And for 40 years, every time God has blessed us, we've given more and we've given more. And what we give today is a whole lot different than what we gave at the beginning. But I'm convinced that for what we gave the Lord off the top, the rest of it has gone farther and farther and farther. But once you do that, then you need to start saving something. Just because I'm close to retirement, we think about that in a few years down the road. Uh, Starting to think about it now, the statistics are scary for what most people have saved. Average American has less than $10,000 saved for retirement and or even emergency. Most people in America are a matter of weeks from if something went wrong and their income stopped or they had an accident or they couldn't work, within a matter of weeks, they would not have enough money to pay the most basic of bills. Now, next Sunday, we're going to talk about this concept of trusting God Don't worry about tomorrow doesn't mean that you don't think about tomorrow. And sometimes we just need to do a little bit better at setting some money aside, and we need to save, and we need to save for the next summer. We need to save for the emergency. We need to save for retirement. We need to save for days in the head, and that's that's good wisdom, and that's one of the things we know about the ant. The ant does that. The ant sets some money aside. So today, kind of just to bring this to an end. Four basic principles. They're not complicated. They're not difficult, but I just want to boil these basic things down. Understand there's lots of little things and, oh, we'll do Dave Ramsey one of these days again, and uh, we'll get around to some other things, and there's lots of good information on lots of good websites, and, and there are people that you could come and talk to if your finances are not where they ought to be. And by the way, getting help is not a bad thing. But here's the basic principles. Number one, Christians work hard. They work hard. Do your job well. Do the best you can. If you're in a hole and you need to work a little harder to get out of the hole, then work hard. Secondly, give generously. And I think that's the order. I think if God gives you a job and you earn something, you give something to acknowledge that. So you work hard, you give generously, you spend wisely. This is from the book of Proverbs. It is all about wisdom. And the one good thing is the scripture says that if you don't have wisdom, all you got to do is ask. God will help you to be wise. And by the way, godly and wise counsel is a good thing. But spend wisely. If God puts it in your possessions, you and I are going to answer for what we do with that. We're either good stewards or bad stewards. We've either wasted it, what he's given us, or we've taken and used it well. And And by the way, when you spend wisely, it's okay to enjoy it. Karen says, we're going out to eat for lunch today. Well, we can. We can afford that. Some of you, maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you need to go home. There were a lot of times where we went home on Sunday morning. But we can eat out, so enjoy it, but spend wisely. And then, last of all, save diligently. And we may talk about that a little bit more in terms next week of thinking about the future and planning for the future and at the same time trusting God. And we'll talk a little bit about insurance and we'll talk about some other things next week in that simple attitude. But today, I don't know where you are financially. Um, Maybe you're a little off. Maybe you need to be adjusted. Maybe you need to say things I want to be careful about. I want to be good. and, And I did an interesting thing. I read some research Basically, where they interviewed people in their 60s or in their retirement, out over 65. And basically, they said, what would you tell young couples if they're just getting started with their finances? What would you tell them? Overwhelmingly, the most important thing they said was, save something. Set it aside every week, every month. And the advantage is, if you set it aside when you're younger, it's a whole lot easier. When my dad said, son, you need to save some money for retirement. I didn't really think about it. And I wanted to say, but I've got three kids. I've got, we're trying to live. We're just trying to get through. And boy, I'm glad we listened to him. Wish we'd listened a lot sooner and maybe a little better, but, but there's something about that basic principle. 
I think that our faith ought to affect every aspect of our lives. I'd like to tell you Christians are better financially than anybody else in the world. I'm afraid it's not that way. But it could be with biblical principles. 